Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much for being with us. Today, let me uh, welcome members of our Board of Trustees. Let me welcome also ambassadors from uh, Colombia, from Russia, Czech Republic, Netherlands, Serbia. Let me welcome also the director of uh, our National Intelligence Center, and of course, all of you. No? And let me welcome especially General Petreus. Thank you very much, General, for sharing with us a few, a few hours of your on not, not out, very tight schedule. My warmest gratitude on behalf of the, of the Elcano Institute. Some years ago, we had the opportunity to receive General Colin Powell. He was then the Secretary of State. Today, we receive another four-star general, uh, an astonishing personality, an outstanding personality, if I, if I may say so. I have always admired those American soldiers able to manage and to be skilled at the same time with the sword and with the pen, with the brain. A soldier in headquarters, a soldier also in the battlefield, but also a writer and a professor at several universities. Let me just tell you a very short summary of his curricula. Uh, for the longer one, you have a couple of books that you can go through. No? David Howell Petraeus is among the most prominent US military figures of the post 9-11 era. During his 37-year career in the United States Army, General Petraeus was widely recognized for his leadership in the search in Iraq, that, uh, as we know, reduced violence in that country by 85%, for his oversight of the organization that produced the U.S. Army Counterinsurgency Manual, and for his command, obviously, of the coalition forces in Afghanistan. General Petraeus is the only person in U.S. Army history to be top graduate in both the U.S. Army Challenging Ranger School and the year-long U.S. Army Command and General Staff College course. He has also a PhD in international relations from Princeton University and completed later a fellowship at Georgetown University. He had assignments as a soldier in Cold War Europe, in Central America, United States, Haiti, Bosnia, Kuwait, Iraq, Afghanistan, Greater Middle East, and Central Asia. He culminated his career with six consecutive commands as a general officer, five of which were in combat record in unmatched in the post-World War II era. After his retirement and following confirmation by the Senate by a vote of 94 to none, to zero, he served as director of the CIA. General Petreus is now uh, a partner with the global investment firm KKR, chairman of the KKR Global Institute, professor at the University of Southern California, fellow at Harvard University, co-chairman of the Woodrow Wilson Institute, vice president of the Royal United Services Institute, and member of the board of the Institute for the Study of War and the Atlantic Council. So you have become kind of a think tanker. So welcome, <laughs> welcome to, the, to the world of, of think tanks. Over the, past, uh, over the past decade, General Petrius was named one of America's 25 best leaders by the U.S. News and World Report, a runner-up for Time Magazine Person of the Year, the Daily Telegraph Men of the Year, a Time 100 selectee, and one of foreign policy magazine's top 100 public intellectuals. He has published recently in Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Foreign Affairs, and Foreign Policy. He has obviously numerous U.S. military condecorations and medals from the State Department, from NATO, from the United Nations, and from at least 13 different foreign countries. Thank you very much, General Petreus, for being with us again this morning. We are going to talk about the uh, changes in foreign and security policy in the U.S. and in the world, of course. Uh, I would like you, General, to start with a general overview of the state of the threats on the world. You are an expert in security, symmetric, asymmetric wars, counterinsurgency, guerrilla, terrorism, cyber also, uh, from your post in the, in the CIA. So please offer us an overview, and then we can enter into more specific issues and more specific scenarios. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with you. Buenas tardes. Uh, Mucho gracias uh, por la calidad bienvenida. Uh, 
It's a privilege and a pleasure uh, to be here with you today, and I thank you for your kind invitation, and I thank you, Professor, for your kind words of introduction, uh, your careful research of my past, and for your <laughs> superb leadership of the Real Institutado uh, Elcano. It's wonderful uh, to be in this stunningly elegant and beautiful green and clean city uh, for the first time, I might add. I've been in Rota, I've been in southern Spain for a NATO summit, I've uh, been in the Riojas area for wine, uh, but I've never been here. And it's a particular pleasure to be here less than a week after Real Madrid so decisively defeated <laughs> Juventus to win its 12th European Cup. Felicitaciones. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. also uh, on the ongoing economic recovery here with projected growth now at 3.2% for the year that lies ahead, uh, a clear reflection uh, that reforms do make a difference, uh, and I congratulate you on that. And more importantly, I note that the firm in which I'm privileged to be a partner, KKR, has made a number of important investments here. A very important reason that it's a privilege to be with you is because it provides me an opportunity to express my gratitude for the superb Spanish soldiers, also sailors, airmen, and Marines, with whom I had the good fortune to serve in a variety of operations in the post-9-11 period, including in NATO and coalition missions in Bosnia, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the waters off Somalia. As was noted, I was deployed for well over six years in the decade after 9-11, and I had a number of visits with your contingents in each deployment. In every instance, they demonstrated enormous professional expertise, impressive determination, and exceptional courage while operating in the most challenging of environments and against determined and often barbaric enemies. All Spanish citizens should be very proud of the performance of their men and women in uniform during these operations, and it's a privilege to have some of them here with us Thank you. this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I was asked in my opening comments essentially to address the state of the world. Uh, of course, <laughs> capturing the state of the world in a few words is not easy. Um, some candidate words would certainly include in transition, uh, uncertain, exceedingly complex, very challenging, and contested. In fact, one might use all of those phrases to convey a sufficiently nuanced assessment, for I believe that we are in the period of the most complex array of threats and challenges that we have seen since the end of the Cold War. Let me explain that, if I could, by first briefly describing the six major challenges to global security and stability, and then by focusing on the greater Middle East, where I spent so much time in that post-9-11 period, and offering five lessons that I believe we should learn from our experiences there over the last 15 years. First, the six threats or challenges. The first is the challenge posed by revisionist powers. These are countries not satisfied with the status quo and want to see changes in it, sometimes legitimately, in some cases pursuing those changes through the use of force. These countries certainly include North Korea, Russia, Iran, and even China, noting that the last of those is both the United States' most important trading partner and, in certain respects, America's major strategic competitor and the country with which we must forge a cooperative relationship. The second threat to global security is that posed by Islamic extremists, the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, and their affiliates in various places around the world, among others. We've now achieved considerable momentum in the fight against these organizations, but I believe we'll be engaged in this struggle for at least a generation. And even after we take away their geographic caliphates in Iraq and Syria and bring Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi to justice, we will still have to deal with the virtual caliphate, that established by Islamic extremists in cyberspace. The third threat is that evolving in cyberspace and not mutually exclusive from the previous challenges I mentioned. It includes actions on the internet uh, in cyberspace by nation states, by increasingly dangerous criminal groups, and the most worrisome to me, by extremist groups. 
who are taking actions uh, with groups that have members who have demonstrated the willingness to blow themselves up on the battlefield and who likely would be very hard to deter or dissuade from taking action if they acquire the cyber equivalent of a weapon of mass destruction. For example, the ability to shut down the electrical grid of the Northeast of the United States and to then keep it down for an extended period. The fourth threat, I think, is one that is posed by domestic populism and ultranationalism. We've seen this manifest itself in the Brexit vote in the UK and arguably in yesterday's parliamentary election there as well, undoubtedly in America's presidential election. Populism and ultranationalism in Europe due to the influx of refugees, sluggish economic growth, concerns over globalism, and fear of technological displacement, as well as other factors. These have caused various forces. They were defeated in the Dutch and French elections, to be sure, but they still pose a significant challenge in a number of countries. The fifth threat is that presented by the many challenges to the rules-based liberal international order. This is, of course, comprised of the international organizations, the financial institutions, and the norms for international relations that have stood the world in quite good stead after their establishment nearly 70 years ago, following, of course, a 50-year period that saw two terribly destructive world wars and the worst economic depression in modern history. Now, however, there are numerous strains and stresses on this order by a variety of forces, among which is a seeming ambivalence on the part of the world's leading country to continue to exercise the traditional role it has played since the end of World War II. The sixth threat is one that some observers might offer, uh, and that is that it is the one presented by the hyper-partisanship and seeming dysfunction in Washington, D.C. I would not necessarily join such observers, and I'd be happy to explain that during the Q&A, but it certainly is something that does present some challenges. Well, with those challenges in mind, let me offer five lessons that I think we should have learned from the past 15 years or so fighting Islamist extremists in the greater Middle East. And by the greater Middle East, I mean also that which stretches into North Africa and over into Central uh, and South Asia and perhaps beyond. The first of these lessons is that ungoverned or even inadequately governed spaces in the greater Middle Eastern area will be exploited by Islamist extremists. It's not a question of if, it's merely a question of when and how significantly these areas will be exploited. The second lesson is that we have to take action against the exploitation of these areas by extremists. Unfortunately, Las Vegas rules do not apply in these areas. What happens there does not stay there. So these are not problems that we can admire until they go away. They will not go away, and we have to do something about it. The third lesson is that the United States generally has to lead the campaign, albeit with a coalition of countries that is as big and as capable as is possible, and with Muslim countries uh, among the members of that coalition. After all, this is really more of a fight within a civilization, within the Muslim world, than it is a fight or a clash between civilizations, to harken back to the book by Sam Huntington of Harvard by that title. And we want all of them involved. But again, the U.S. generally is going to have to lead because it has far more of the assets that are proving to be so useful in the ongoing efforts in Iraq and Syria and in, else, in other areas. And by these elements, I mean the unmanned aerial vehicles, the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets that enable us to understand over time what it is that we're seeing below us the so-called unblinking eye, constantly watching the areas where the extremists are active, the precision strike assets that enable us generally to do considerable damage to them with, while trying to minimize the damage to innocent civilians and infrastructure, 
And then the industrial strength ability to fuse intelligence, as your intelligence chief and former chief of defense staff knows, something that is very, very important in these kinds of fights, to take all of the different information from all of the different sources, uh, from human intelligence, cyberspace, signals intelligence, measurement and data and so forth, all then digitized, analyzed, with, again, very substantial uh, capabilities, and again, an area in which the United States brings a very significant capability. If you take all of the capabilities of all of our possible coalition partners and allies and group them together and multiply times six, I think you still would not have quite all of that which the United States can now bring to bear uh, as a result of all of the procurement that was taken during the surge in Iraq and in Afghanistan in the greater Middle East, much of the time when I was privileged to be the commander. The fourth lesson is that the campaign has to be a comprehensive one, a comprehensive civil military campaign. The paradox of this fight is that we cannot counter terrorist forces like the Islamic State and Al Qaeda with just counter terrorist force operations. It takes much more than that. It takes the entire gamut uh, of activities that we had in the civil military campaign plan during the surge in Iraq. But now, with host nation forces, the Iraqis or Syrian forces or others in North Africa or in Afghanistan, with them doing the fighting on the front lines, uh, with them undertaking the political reconciliation, the reestablishment of basic services, reconstruction, uh, the rebuilding of local economies, schools, health clinics, and so forth, with us providing, certainly, these supportive enabling assets providing advice, providing assistance, providing training and equipping and other resources, but with them doing the fighting on the front lines. The fifth lesson is that the contribution of the U.S. and the coalition has to be sustainable. And sustainability is measured in the expenditure of blood and treasure. But it not only has to be sustainable, it has to be a sustained commitment. That is the answer, I believe, in these different efforts, because this is a generational struggle, as I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, these are not battles where you can take the hill, plant the flag, and go home to a victory parade. Rather, they continue. Uh, and even after, again, taking away the geographic caliphate, we will have to deal with the virtual caliphate, as I mentioned a moment earlier. So there you have the complex array of threats and challenges, which also do present opportunities uh, that face the world today. And there you have the lessons I believe we should take from our experiences of the last 15 years. And with those opening remarks, Professor, again, over to you for questions, and then I guess for those submitted by the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General. Uh, we can then move to more specific questions. You mentioned the liberal international order as, as one of the, main, of the main challenges. And you said also, among the lessons, that the United States has to lead. Well, well the question now is, uh, to what extent the liberal international order is over, is in danger? We learned that uh, the United States was leading from behind. We learned about strategic patience. Uh, the other day, I had the opportunity to, to see a debate between the British historian Niels Ferguson and Faris Zakaria. Ferguson sustained strongly that the liberal international order was already over because of the retrenchment mainly of UK and the US, both. The both countries that push Western values and institutions to the world democracy, human rights, uh, free trade, now seem to be retrenching and defending from the penetration of the world into them, N no more uh, willing to lead. And uh, so, so the question has two sides. No? One is, to what extent the liberal international order can be sustained, is over, and to what extent the US, the UK, but the US mainly is capable of providing public goods that has been providing for so long? 
Well, obviously, I'm one who believes in that liberal no. international order. Uh, I believe it has generally stood the world in, in reasonably good stead uh, since it was established again some 70 plus years ago. Um, certainly there have been difficult times, but we have s certainly not seen the kinds of devastating world wars or economic depression that these institutions, norms, uh, and organizations were created to try to, to avoid and, and to minimize the chance uh, of seeing again. So I think it is something that is worth sustaining, certainly something that has to accommodate uh, changes in uh, the rise, for example, of China. I think without question, I think China was right to be frustrated that we did not change the International Monetary Fund voting rights until after it was too late, frankly. Uh, and led to the establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, very likely, something that we should have joined uh, from the beginning. Um, so there have been missteps. Uh, there have to be changes. There have to be adjustments as some powers rise and others are, relatively speaking, uh, a, a bit uh, less powerful, if you will, in the grand scheme of things in terms of overall national power. I think the United States is very capable uh, of continuing to lead. Uh, the question is whether the seeming ambivalence that we demonstrate at times, uh, the frustration at times, perhaps understandable, but uh, frustration nonetheless uh, about the expenditure in nation building overseas when we should be doing nation building at home and infrastructure at home and so forth. Uh, all of that, again, understandable, but I tend to think that, and even with this administration, there has generally been a reversion to uh, our traditional policies, in some cases applying them even better, in some cases perhaps uh, pursuing some uh, courses that might be questioned uh, by others. Uh, but generally, uh, after taking a phone call from Taiwan and, and few other, and some tweets that were uh, raised questions about the one China policy. President Trump has embraced the one China policy, hosted his Chinese counterpart for the Mar-a-Lago summit, established a relationship that will be very, very important uh, in the years that lie ahead, not the least of which it will be in dealing with North Korea. Uh, there was a, a seeming ambivalence about one state, two state, with respect to the Palestinian issue when Prime Minister Netanyahu was in the Oval Office the next day our ambassador to the United Nations clarified that our policy remains the two-state uh, solution. Uh, there was questioning about NATO and all the rest of this. Generally, we have embraced NATO. Certainly, the president did when the secretary general of NATO was there. Yes, to be sure, the, the Article 5 reassurance uh, was somehow uh, not in his remarks, which did raise eyebrows, understandably, all, although the vice president and the Secretary of Defense and others have indeed come out and clarified that that commitment remains very much uh, real for the United States. Uh, and frankly, we have seen decisions made uh, fairly quickly and appropriately where there was not a decision taken in the past. Uh, when Bashar al-Assad's uh, regime forces used chemical weapons, uh, within 36 hours or so, there was a response. The president showed the willingness to, again, to decide and to direct action, which I think was appropriate, uh, proportionate, and, and measured. Uh, and so, again, clearly still the American foreign policy is evolving. Uh, clearly there are issues in which one may, may have raise some questions. Uh, climate, for example, uh, with walking away from the, the or renouncing the intent to withdraw from the Paris Accords, although I think there will still be very significant, by and large, we've already almost met the uh, requirements established for ourselves, and frankly, market forces are going to drive us forward, as well as states and municipalities, many of which have already raised their hand and say, regardless of the national policy, they will continue. But there is symbolism there uh, that I clearly recognize. And there certainly are issues still very much to be resolved when it comes to immigration uh, and to uh, trade issues, and we'll have to see how that does evolve uh, in the future. But again, to sum up, I think that the, the international order is very much worth sustaining. 
while noting that there should be uh, a, uh, a good faith uh, effort, uh, a rational approach that does accommodate the rise of China, that will in the future undoubtedly accommodate the rise of India uh, and perhaps some other uh, major powers in the making, um, but also does preserve those institutions, those organizations, and those norms that have generally guided uh, the world uh, well over the last 70 years. Well, listening, uh, listening to you and to some other experts that have been visiting us uh, lately at the Elcano Institute, one has the feeling that there is kind of a uh, lack of uh, coordination between uh, some of the statements by the president and some of the statements by the establishment or even by uh, well, some secretaries of state, uh, defense, and etc. Et no? uh, as, as if you were trying to, uh, to defend him, uh, to defend the president uh, from some of uh, his tweets and, and most uh, daring during a statement made, made now and then. No? Finally, everything is going to be okay. Uh, finally, everything is going to, to be arranged uh, and things are not going to change so, so, so much. Let's well, hope you're I, right. Let's I hope would, you're right. No, I, I think it is, it is only forthright to acknowledge that there is, as in any administration, I experienced this in two previous minutes, two a Republican and a Democrat. I, was privileged. I am totally, truly nonpartisan. Uh, I stopped voting even, much yeah. less registering to vote. Uh, when I was promoted to two stars, I never have started again. I have served both Republican and uh, Democratic presidents in positions that had to be approved by, confirmed by the Senate, as you noted. Um, and in every administration, there are forces pulling in one direction, mm. Uh, and forces pulling in the other. Um, and presidents, at the end of the day, have to make some tough decisions, but they do get swayed back and forth. And I think we're seeing some of this uh, be between, again, probably slightly differing views on uh, what the U.S. role in the world should be. Uh, what does it mean to say America first? Does it mean, doesn't mean America alone, or does it mean, again, so, there is some of this going on, and I think it's just, uh, again, uh, accurate uh, to observe that that is taking place, as it has taken place in, in each of the administrations that I was privileged to serve in at a sufficient level to see that kind of debate going on. Yeah, and, and in a sense, we have good reasons to, to have confidence in the checks and balances of the American system. And, and indeed, we have, we have seen that working already. Very much so. I do think that it's very important. I mean, people come up to me, and I do travel a great deal. I think of this is maybe the 19th or 20th country this year so far, uh, and at least three of them I've been in two or three times each. And I have gone uh, to great lengths to establish that you should remember the checks and balances in the U.S. system. Uh, this is not a parliamentary system where the president absolutely has control of the legislative branch in the way that most parliamentary systems have, if, at least if they enjoy a, a majority. Uh, and the judicial branch, as we are seeing, is very independent as well. Um, beyond that, states have enormous power in the United mm -hmm. States. They can sue uh, the, 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 the nation state, the, and they are, over the attempted Muslim ban. Uh, cities have great powers uh, in yeah, our system. States. The people, the press, all the rest of this. And these are all forces that mm -hmm. are, again, tugging on this which direction. I, what I would also point out is when people say, my gosh, this is the most partisan and difficult of times for the United States, um, I, I am tempted to say au contraire. Uh, let's remember that we've had some reasonably partisan times in the past, and our country has emerged from it and gone on to do great things. You know, we had this little thing called a civil war for four years yeah. uh, of the North fighting the South over a hundred year, or hundred, not quite a hundred years into our existence. I mean, if you go all the way back to the founding fathers, these great visionary men who wrote the great documents, the mm -hmm. Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and uh, established the early policies that still stand us in reasonably good stead, people who are literally on pedestals around the, the Capitol building and elsewhere, let's remember that the serving Vice President of the United States shot and killed 
the first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, in a duel. That's partisanship. Uh, at least we haven't had any of that in recent <laughs> times. So beyond that, if I could point out, um, there is, I am somebody who does believe that the United States is, has special blessings in a variety of different ways. Obviously, we have a, a NATO ally to the north and a friend to the south. We have water to the east and the west. We have extraordinary resource uh, blessings. And then we have these founding documents that, as I've mentioned, have stood us in very good stead over the years. And indeed, I taught a course uh, up until just this last semester. I finally no longer could do it once a week at the Honors College of the City University of New York that was called the North American Decades, which is how I describe, that's how I answer the question. In fact, I got it four years ago in London. Someone said, General, after the American century, what? And I think they expected me to say the Chinese century or the Asian century. And I said, after the American century, the North American decades. There's an S on the end. Now, the number of decades will be determined by how well uh, Washington does in turning some legislative and political headwinds into tailwinds to enable some of the areas in which we are among the leaders in the world. But again, as you look at what's going on in the global economy, certainly watching the, the great transition in, in China where everything is great. Uh, there's been a joke, by the way, that perhaps President Trump might ask China to build the Great Wall uh, in our <laughs> in southern Mexico. border. Um, <laughs> others have said that, not I. Um, yeah. But I look, then we looked in this course at four revolutions. Uh, the IT revolution, the manufacturing revolution, the energy revolution, and the life sciences revolution. Again, the U.S. either leading or among the leaders in each of these. And none ex exemplifies or, or, or illustrates the U.S. better than the energy revolution. There are a number of other countries in the world that have more gas and oil in their shale, in their deep, dense rock. Only in the United States has very significant amount of production come from that rock. And it's because of a number of factors that are unique to the United States. First of all, we invented the technology of deep and then directional drilling. You have to go horizontal because the shale runs like this. Uh, hydraulic fracturing to, to, to free the trapped gas and oil. And seismic big data to know precisely where to drill. We have small and medium enterprises that can rapidly build out that technology and respond to market forces. We have agile capital markets, which again, I'm privileged to be part of these days with KKR, that can invest quickly uh, and enable these small and medium enterprises to grow and to expand and take advantage of, of market opportunities. We have a legal structure that allows you to sell or rent the mineral rights or the minerals underneath uh, your ground that you own, land that you own. We have reasonable infrastructure for pushing it around. Yes, we do need more infrastructure in a host of ways in the United States. My hope is that that is truly going to be President Trump's and our Congress's next big uh, area of focus, because they'll find there is actually bipartisan agreement on that. And so, again, uniquely, these qualities, and uniquely, that's what has enabled the United States to completely disrupt uh, energy markets, and it's why you all are presumably paying a lot less uh, for a liter of gasoline and even a lot less for natural gas. Uh, because we're now the number one natural gas producer in the world, and we likely will be the number one crude oil producer uh, when this next cycle of uh, shale uh, production uh, is complete within, say, the next year or so. And oil prices are not coming back, despite what some folks uh, may hope uh, who are in among our coalition partners. Well, I, I can assure you, I think that nobody here doubts about the vitality of, of U.S. society, capacity to, to develop technologies and put them on the market, et cetera. I would like to, you mentioned China as the main strategic uh, vector, so to say. Yes. Uh, I would like to move to that. But before, I, I'd like to, to write a question that I think is important. You mentioned Islamic extremism, terrorism. You mentioned also weapons of mass destruction. What's the danger of uh, terrorist groups uh, obtaining weapons of, of mass destruction? It hasn't happened yet. I think it's a crucial, crucial. It, 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 it can change completely. It, it will be a game changer completely. And I don't know to what extent this is a real danger or just a, a fantasy. No, I think it's a very real danger. Again, in particular, because these are groups that 
again, if, if their members are willing to blow themselves up on the battlefield, there are some other soldiers in here that know that the most challenging threat in the world is an enemy who's willing to blow himself up to take you with him. I mean, I remember when we had the first suicide attack, we were still doing the fight to Baghdad. I was just a two-star general at the time, a division commander, uh, and I heard it over the radio, and it just gave a chill went down my spine. Uh, wow, you know, how do you counter someone who's willing to die to take you with him? Um, and so that presents a very difficult issue in terms of how do you deter or dissuade uh, action. Uh, the idea of mutual assured destruction or something doesn't yeah. work with that kind of uh, individual being involved. So it's crucial that we prevent nuclear weapons, chemical or biological weapons, or That's even now, cyber. what I alluded to earlier, a potential cyber capability that has the same effect of a weapon of mass destruction. And I gave as the example, say, shutting down the electrical grid uh, mm -hmm. of a major metropolitan area, or perhaps a region yeah. uh, of the United States or another major country around the world. Uh, this is very worrisome and is something that we've got to work very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And I know, I can tell you that the intelligence services uh, are very keen uh, in watching to it to do everything possible to mitigate the risks of this happening. Yeah, you mentioned back to now to to, to China. Uh, as you know, Obama Obama started the pivot to Asia, <clears throat> and uh, and somehow away from Europe. Uh, yeah, he, that's he, why he, I, don't, he, I never he, like that term yeah. pivot because it means you're pivoting from yeah. somewhere to something. And I really do believe rebalance. Mm -hmm was much more accurate. Yeah. In fact, we pivoted back to Europe. Yeah. For those that say, you know, is the U.S. commitment to NATO still viable, for example, or still real, um, I, would, I would offer what the commander of U.S. Army Europe uh, uh, said at a recent gathering. Um, this is the great General, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, who I was privileged to have uh, uh, under my command for the fight to Baghdad as a brigade commander multiple subsequent times. Uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he said, follow the money and follow the troops. And if you do that, you will see that there has been more money allocated uh, for the European Defense Initiative, or uh, our, our version of that, uh, billions more. And you'll see that we have troops out in uh, now in the Baltic okay. states and eastern Poland, uh, together with a number of other uh, NATO par partner countries, ally countries. Um, so again, that's very important uh, to follow, I think, uh, and that's the manifestation of the commitment to NATO, and I think it's very real and very enduring. Russia, China, uh, United States. Uh, apparently, Trump was turning on its head Nixon's policy. Nixon's idea was engaged with uh, China to control, to control Russia. Apparently, <coughs> Trump, at least during his campaign, seem to be following the opposite direction. Let's uh, engage uh, Russia to control China, which is our major strategic uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge. Uh, do you, how, how do you see that? Is that, well, is I that think still we, the case? No, uh, I, I don't think it is. It has fact, changed completely. Yeah, I think Russia, in fact, one of the Russian, I think may have been the foreign minister, um, said, you know, this is the return to the Cold War. He said it's very, very chilly right now. And so, uh, Vladimir Putin's hopes that all of a sudden he was going to have an acquiescent or pliant uh, president of the United States, I think, have, have proven uh, to be uh, wrong um, mm. and a mistake. Uh, clearly, again, the president has embraced the one China policy. Yes, there are concerns about China's action in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, which are very legitimate and the militarization of those uh, islands is a concern. Just the literal construction of them is a concern because they're then trying to assert sovereignty over waters around that, which is not justified under the UN Convention and the law of the sea. Um, but working our way through that uh, and noting the concerns of every single country that has a maritime boundary with China, uh, nonetheless, the commitment to the one China policy, I think, is very firm. We've seen it reiterated. And frankly, we're seeing focus on the real issue, uh, the most pressing threat, I think, potential pressing threat in the world today uh, from a U.S. perspective and perhaps from a Chinese perspective as well, is the advent of North Korea having 
a nuclear capability that could actually be delivered to, say, Los Angeles or San Francisco. Uh, and the, the big question hanging over this is whether, of course, Kim Jong-un uh, is a rational actor uh, or not, uh, when he has certainly shown to be a highly impulsive, uh, seemingly uh, uh, mad actor, uh, when you think of how he had his brother-in-law uh, killed uh, overseas, uh, with a nerve agent in an airport, uh, and uh, the inventive ways in which he has dispatched uh, his uncle and a number of others who he felt were emerging as threats to him. Uh, and you'll see the U.S. and China working on this, and I think you will see China taking firmer action. At the end of the day, China keeps the lights on in Pyongyang, and while understanding China's uh, concerns that, that there not be a hostile government in Pyongyang, that there not be U.S. troops on the Yalu River the, that demarcates the boundary between North Korea and China. In fact, China has two mechanized divisions north of that now to ensure there are also not refugees uh, flowing north. Understanding all of those uh, concerns, uh, I think it also understands the United States concern uh, that a madman um, seeming madman might have a capability to take out one of our uh, major cities on the west coast of the United States. Something that President Trump uh, has stated uh, he, in a tweet, which is how policy emerges sometimes. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, in, the it art, will, in the it art of the happen. deal, also in his book, in the art of the deal, he talked about the strategy of the madman. Didn't well, it, now you have to watch that, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one, you know, look, you, he does employ the tech tactics uh, explained in there of trying to get his negotiating partner, if you will, or adversary or what have you, off balance. I mean, literally, you know, sort of punch him in the nose rhetorically before you even sit down and start negotiating. <laughs> the problem with that um, is, by the way, that may actually be getting more spending by NATO countries than was the case before. You know, I sat as a NATO commander, a four-star, I guess, at the time, and heard Secretary Gates um, criticizing in his final speech at the North Atlantic Council, uh, ministerial, uh, the defense spending. And I do think uh, that in that regard, the president is right, that there should be uh, higher defense spending by our NATO allies. Um, but at the end of the day, again, if you have this madman image that may be useful before you get into a crisis, it is not when you are in a crisis, because if the other side thinks you are led by a madman, he may actually decide to take action before you can. And uh, so in terms of crisis stability, that poses some significant concerns. By the way, you were somehow suggesting that China has some kind of control over North Korea, hidden, indirect. Oh, it's not hidden at all. It's very much... Sorry. I mean, China is the biggest market for everything that North Korea produces. It's a big you know, coal lot importer. Of people, lot of people it say literally, that. it's the only provider of crude oil mm -hmm. uh, to the refinery that one refinery that, that North Korea has up in the north. Um, it literally could turn off the lights in Pyongyang mm -hmm. uh, if it wanted to. Now, I'm not suggesting that that be done because we're all also concerned about what would happen in the event of a collapse. Uh, of North Korea and what, you know, no one knows what happens. So you'd like to have some kind of uh, orderly way forward. Uh, but I think clearly this is a time where strategic dialogue is absolutely necessary. Uh, by the way, I believe it's necessary with Russia as well. I agree with Dr. Kissinger on that. Um, we've had dialogue with enemies uh, throughout our history. Uh, we had dialogue with enemies on the battlefield. We reconciled one of the big ideas, remember, by the way, the surge in Iraq, the surge that mattered most was the surge of ideas. It was the change in strategy. It was 180 degrees different over what we were doing prior to the surge. So the additional forces were, were very helpful in implementing this more rapidly so that we could show progress to the Senate when I went back in the, in the House of Representatives, when I went back at the six-month mark. That was crucial. And we couldn't have done it without the extra forces, but we also couldn't have done it if we hadn't completely changed the strategy. Instead of consolidating on big bases, we recognize that you have to live with the people to secure them. And we established in the Baghdad area alone 77 additional locations. We had to fight for most of those. Instead of handing off to the Iraqis who couldn't handle the level of violence, we took back control. 
Um, instead of just sort of tolerating reconciliation, we embraced it. My very first trip outside the city was to see the one courageous sheikh, uh, sheikh uh, Sitar in Ramadi, west of Baghdad in Anbar, very violent Anbar province, who had stood up to the Islam, uh, the, at that time, Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, with our backing. And I sought to figure out how we could do that throughout Anbar province, all the way up and down the Euphrates River Valley, and then ultimately to get it going up the Tigris River. And there are a number of other uh, ways in which we change that too. So you've got to get the big ideas right. And again, I think one of the big ideas is that you shouldn't be afraid to talk with competitors, with adversaries. Um, you just need to do it with your eyes wide open. And you should not delude yourself uh, mm -hmm. about those areas in which we have conflicting interests, even as you should acknowledge that there may be areas in which you have common interests, mm -hmm. such as with Russia, the, uh, the defeat of Islamist extremists, very much in their interest as well. They have also suffered uh, from extremist attacks in their homeland. One question on, 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 on China and then another on, on, on Russia. No? No, on China, uh, to what extent is possible peaceful ascent, as the Chinese experts and the Chinese politicians are, are uh, saying, uh, to what extent we are condemned to the so-called to see the strap, whereas, you know, yes. the ascent yes. uh, and the yeah. descent and uh, this yeah. emerging and... Uh, it's a great question, and interestingly, coincidentally, I just interviewed Graham Allison, professor at Harvard. In fact, I'm at a fellow at his uh, Belfer Center for Science and International uh, Relations. Uh, and he just wrote a book, which is subtitled The, 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 Thucydides. the Thucydides Trap, Can China and America uh, Escape the Thucydides Trap? Question uh, mark. And again, the Thucydides Trap, you'll remember, it's named for Thucydides because he chronicled the Peloponnesian Wars in which you had Sparta here and a rising Athens. And then he writes, inevitably, they went to war. and. The question is, how can we avoid that kind of inevitability in this case? And I think it's hugely important, obviously, that we do. Uh, a clash between the number one and number two economies and powers in the world would be devastating uh, for the world, uh, not just even for our two countries. So there's got to be, again, the strategic dialogue to avoid that. By the way, he then looks, Graham Allison, uh, looks at, uh, I think it's 15 cases uh, and or 16 cases, and I think 12 of the 16 resulted in war, uh, and looks at the factors that led to that. Now, we do have, obviously, one very significantly different factor, that we are in a nuclear age. Uh, and obviously, that gives great pause uh, to leaders, but the key is to avoid backing into a conflict, uh, as really happened with that most studied uh, conflict in a case where, you know, the, the assassination of a a relatively minor archduke leads to Europe being in flames uh, in World War I. So dialogue, hugely important. Uh, there are going to have to be accommodations on both sides, I think, as well as there are going to have to be assertions. Uh, there are issues uh, where uh, there should be legitimate trade disputes by the United States over an inability to access certain markets uh, in, in China. Uh, so again, we are going to have to work that out. Uh, this is not about, you know, trying to impose our system or the system that we all share. Uh, this system is done pretty well, by the way. You know, we should acknowledge that China's leaders have helped that country achieve something no other country has ever achieved in history, and that is two decades of year-on-year -year growth, more than 10 percent in economically each year, with I think the exception of one year somewhere around the Great Recession. Uh, that we went through. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the most important relationship in the world, yeah. and it's one that we ha and that's why I was, again, applauding the president very early, reaching out to uh, uh, President Xi, uh, first over the phone, uh, then uh, inviting him to, to China, or to the United States, <clears throat> and, and Mar-a-Lago, uh, a very congenial place, I think, to have a summit. Move to Russia. Russia, to what extent does, um, in your opinion, can be considered a threat in any, in any sense? Uh, is it justified the claims made frequently by the Russians that they have been ill-treated uh, after the Cold War? 
I mean, they have some uh, rational, justified <coughs> claims to be made. I, th I think that's questionable, although to be charitable, perhaps, uh, from their perspective, uh, I think you might be able to misperceive what has been done. Because, I, look, I was in the councils that decided various actions to which Russia has objected. Um, and frankly, I don't see them as, an, as a desire to do damage to Russia. In fact, Russia was welcomed into the Council of NATO. Uh, I remember here, you, you know, we'd, you'd, you'd have the normal North Atlantic Council meeting, then you'd have one that was with Russia, and then you'd have one that was with Ukraine. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, what we see is an individual leading a country who truly believes what he has said in the past, that, you know, the worst day of the 20th century, if not world history, was when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. dissolved, collapsed. Uh, and he is intent on reestablishing as much of the Soviet Union or Russian Empire, or whatever you, however you may want to term it, uh, as possible, to stride the world stage, to be consequential. It had to rankle enormously for him to hear President Obama label Russia a regional power, uh, as he did one time. And how sweet it must have been for him to provide the solution that got us out of the challenge that we were in when the red line that turned out not to be a red line uh, and was resolved by Russia uh, getting an agreement with Bashar al-Assad to get, as it turns out now, about 90 percent or so of the chemical weapons uh, out of Syria. Uh, he's invaded neighboring countries, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia and, and Georgia. In fact, I commanded Georgian troops at the time that happened in Iraq. We had an entire brigade of them. And by the way, they said they wanted to be out and in an area of responsibility. That, and I said, you're going to take casualties out there. He said, regrettably, that we know that but we want to contribute, and it was very impressive, but we had to send them home very, very quickly. Uh, we've watched as he's taken Crimea, uh, the southeastern Ukraine, the so-called Donbass, uh, fomented separatists, uh, provided them uh, with weapons, money, uh, training, advisors, and a variety of other assets, uh, has tried to intimidate the Baltic states, is carrying out very aggressive maneuvers at, at sea and in the air and so forth. Um, these are not very neighborly. And uh, ironically, I think this is backfiring big time on Vladimir Putin and Russia. Nothing has given NATO a, a reason to live as much as that has. Uh, and NATO is back in many respects because of that, at a time when many were seeing its utility uh, as we drew down in Afghanistan uh, to be diminishing. So. Uh, I think he's got to be very careful. And I think now the intrusion into domestic politics in the United States to undermine the confidence of the American people in our electoral system uh, did the same very significantly in France and in other European countries. Do you That's think so? Do you think that well. it was in... Oh, there's no question about no question. this. This is absolutely indisputable. Now, it's a question whether he truly wanted to tip the scales in favor of Donald Trump or not. It seems as if that was the case. I mean, he only released the emails of the uh, the Democratic Party, uh, not the Republican Party. But whatever, in, in, in this case, this is going to backfire because he's going to see additional sanctions uh, from the U.S. Congress, very likely, uh, and will not see the lifting of sanctions that he might have aspired to um, at, at some point that have been so difficult at a time when a country which used to get 60 percent of its revenue from the export of natural gas and oil uh, is, has seen that cut in half because of the collapse of oil prices and the compression of natural gas prices around the world, as we actually predicted at the KKR Global Institute two and a half years ago, all the world prices have, co have compressed to the price of U.S. natural gas plus the cost of liquefaction, transport, and regasification. Mm. And look all around the world, obviously Australia and LNG has played a role in this as well. Uh, and we're going to see other entrants to the natural gas. Israel is going to be an energy superpower uh, in the natural gas arena. Uh -huh. Well, I think we have covered a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions. We move to the questions and answers. I have plenty, plenty of them. Uh, first one is almost uh, unavoidable for you. I missed your assessment about Afghanistan. And he adds, uh, have you seen War Machine with Brad Pitt? What's your review of the, I, I consider, your review uh, of the, I, of the I movie? Have not, yeah, I and have not seen another, it. Another, more or less the same, what, what's the, 
withdrawal of ISAF from Afghanistan in error? Go. Um, first of all, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, I saw the trailer, you know, the, the little clip, and that was enough for me. Um, I'd love to have Brad Pitt play me in a movie, but I'd like him to be a little more animated and less stiff than it appeared that he was uh, in that movie. Um, look, what, when we look at Afghanistan, we should start by remembering that there's a reason we went there and there's a reason that we have stayed. We went there because that's where the 9-11 attacks were planned by Al-Qaeda during the time that the Taliban ruled the country. It's the place where the initial training of the attackers was conducted. And our mission uh, has been all along primary mission to ensure that it, that country is not once again a sanctuary for uh, Islamist extremists uh, as it was prior to 9-11. And so far, we have been accomplishing that mission. And I would uh, salute the Spanish forces that I visited in, in west, northwest Afghanistan, uh, who did an absolutely superb job. I think the commander at my time is now your deputy army commander. Uh, very, very professional. Had read the counterinsurgency field manual and then had understood how to apply it in that particular part of uh, sort of northwestern Herat and going into the other uh, neighboring province. Um, now, what should we do in the future? Uh, did we draw down too fast? We certainly drew down faster than I recommended. It's publicly known that I recommended a slower withdrawal. Yeah. Um, and I do think that was proven in hindsight now because now we've stopped the withdrawal and I think we are posed to, uh, I hope, uh, to have a, a, a policy initiative that would be what I think should be a sustainable, sustained commitment. Um, look, we let, had 40 some odd thousand troops in Korea, hundreds of thousands in Europe for years. And if we can have this be sustainable, again, the expenditure of blood and treasure, uh, the Afghan forces are very much fighting and dying tragically for their country. And we should support them, them better and uh, several thousand, perhaps as many as 5,000 additional U.S. forces, maybe a similar number of additional coalition forces with the authorities to advise and assist a bit closer uh, to the front lines uh, with authorities to support the Afghan forces with our air power uh, more easily. Uh, all of this could make a dramatic difference, I think. Uh, it would halt the momentum of the Taliban right now. That situation is fraught. Uh, horrific uh, losses in some of the recent suicide attacks uh, in Kabul. Uh, it is in our interest not to see that, uh, again, uh, devolve further. Uh, we have a, a, a fine president of Afghanistan who's serious about issues like corruption and all the rest of this. Uh, a huge problem. The challenges there are, are very considerable without question. We're not going to win this and go home or something like that. Certainly, we should pursue reconciliation, but I have to tell you that it is very difficult to get an enemy to reconcile with you if you can't reach his headquarters uh, because they're in a neighboring country uh, where you have limited ability and limited uh, authority to do anything about it. That is a huge difference. When I went to Afghanistan, when I had the confirmation hearing for that position in the U.S. Senate uh, Armed Services Committee, I said then, we are not going to be able to flip Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan is very, very different from Iraq. I did believe we could do what we did in Iraq. We'd done it before. We'd done it in the first year. We did reconciliation in the wake of firing of the army. A huge mistake to fire a military without telling them what their future was. That was the real error. Um, and then to fire the Ba'ath Party all the way down to level four mm -hmm. without telling them what their future is and having an agreed reconciliation policy uh, was another colossal uh, error. And that literally created the insurgency. Now, we were able to reconcile in the area I was privileged to command in northern Iraq, in Mosul, in fact, because I got special authority from Ambassador Bremer. Uh, but nowhere else was that the case. And then ultimately, the Iraqi authorities in Baghdad would not support what it was we did. To give you a sense of the magnitude of this, in Mosul University, which had 30,000 students, this is not a small college, it had about 18 or 19 different colleges within it. 120 faculty members were Bath Level 4. That's the bottom level that was, was thrown out. Many of them had had to join the Bath Party to go study overseas, make sure they came home, and they got automatically elevated uh, over time. 
Now, don't get me wrong, by the way, level one, level two, even level three, um, you know, and we were proud to, frankly, to have killed Saddam's two sons, Uday and Kuse, incredibly uh, took truly barbaric actions uh, mm -hmm. over the years against their own citizens. But the level four, uh, without reconciliation, you've just thrown them on the ash heap of history. They have no, nothing they can do in that country where almost every job was linked to the government mm -hmm. and they're thrown out of it and out of their house, out of their car and out of their status in society. Mm -hmm. And by the way, these were our kind of people. This is who we should have wanted running the country. They were largely Western, largely US educated. Um, they had a much more progressive view of the world than those who replaced them that tended to be quite uh, uh, Islamist. Um, Heck, they drank. I mean, this, these were our, our, our kind of folks. Um, they would have loved Spanish red wine. Um, <laughs> so we did not, by the way. I mean, I, I mean, we loved it, but we didn't drink it because we were under general order number one, which meant no drinking in those countries. Um, but again, um, in the case now, again, in Afghanistan, uh, I think that a sustained, sustained commitment is warranted uh, one that we should indeed sustain for years, give the Afghans the confidence that we're not going to, 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 to leave them, give them the confidence to invest in their own country again rather than taking their money to Dubai or leaving the country, uh, and try to help continue to achieve that basic mission that that country not be a sanctuary for transnational extremism again. In relation to what you have been saying about Afghanistan and many other areas, you talked before about a comprehensive approach yes. to these issues. Uh, are, are you worried by the fact that the U.S. budget has diminished dramatically the budget in diplomacy and aid to development? Yes, in fact, I'm... Has um, increased in defense am, and diminished... I am a two? signatory to a letter. Um, a number of, uh, of, of generals and others, uh, I generally don't sign these big mass mailing kind of letters. Uh, I'd rather do it myself or, uh, or again, I'd, I'm not partisan. But in this case, I did, uh, and it expressed our concern, and it quoted our superb Secretary of Defense. By the way, we have a tremendous national security team with General McMaster, a longtime protege of mine, uh, his deputy also, many of his National Security Council staff, the Secretary of Defense, uh, the UN Ambassador, the Secretary of State, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the commanders of the regions, uh, and the commanders on the ground in Iraq uh, uh, and in Afghanistan. These are superb people. And General Mattis, now our Secretary of Defense, uh, is famous for having said, if you don't give me enough diplomats, you're going to have to send me more bullets. Uh, and I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I have questions, except from Vanuatu and the Solomon Oi Islands, about any, any other corner in the world. Yes, I have questions about, about anything. Uh, let's, uh, let's start with some of them. Uh, Turkey. Turkey. To what extent is Turkey a reliable partner for, for us, for NATO? I think, I think Turkey has proven to be a reliable partner. We do have uh, assets. We have assets. Other NATO countries have assets um, in a variety of locations in Turkey, uh, supporting the efforts in uh, Syria principally, but also in Iraq. And by the way, we have provided them. It started when I was the commander of the multinational force in Iraq during the surge, where the decision was made my decision to send them a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, unblinking eye in the sky to help them uh, in their fight against the PKK, the Turkish Kurd extremists, uh, with whom they subsequently had a ceasefire, uh, but then, un unfortunately, was, was undone. Um, so again, I think there has been a very much a two-way street. Spanish uh, Patriot uh, okay. air defense batteries are there, along with US air defense batteries. Um, the Article 5 is, is very much uh, in force with them. Um, certainly there has been political turbulence. There was the, the tragic uh, coup attempt uh, that caused so much turmoil, uh, has resulted in the uh, uh, firing or jailing of so many uh, members of a variety of very important institutions. Um, obviously all of that very, very, very regrettable uh, and sad to watch for someone who's been you know, the first time I was in Turkey was when I was a, a first lieutenant with an airborne battalion in, in Italy, and we were out in the, the far eastern part of Turkey, uh, Erzurum and Kars, 
Uh, I remember my father-in-law was the four-star NATO commander for Turkey uh, and Greece at the time. Uh, and all the Turks would say, oh, you will be general very soon too then. I said, no, it <laughs> doesn't work that way in our country. Um, but we... Well, he was right. Well, <laughs> it took about 25 years, but, you know. Uh, in, in any event, I, look, this is an ally. Uh, it's a trading partner. Um, their economy, by the way, is starting to come back a bit now uh, after s suffering uh, considerably. Uh, obviously, certain sectors, tourism in particular, have not yet really started to come back in the way that they'd like to see. Um, but a country that is a huge source uh, of exports to Germany, as an example, and to other countries in Europe, and uh, from uh, Germany and other countries as well. So that's yet another relationship uh, that has to be sustained, uh, albeit observing, in some cases, with concern, uh, some of the developments there. We haven't say a word about Latin America, which is very near, I mean, to Spaniards which is not unusual, because normally it's completely absent from overall world pictures. We know that, no? But uh, let's uh, have a little discussion about uh, Latin America, mainly, obviously, Venezuela, uh, Cuba also. Uh, Obama's change of policy, uh, is that working? You think Trump, President Trump, is going to change that? How do you <coughs> see Venezuela mainly, which is now the new Cuba, so to say? Well, uh, first of all, let me just say, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time uh, down there over the years, um, first as a soldier, as an intel chief, uh, and now, frankly, as an investor as well. I have always admired the architecture in a number of the grand uh, capitals of uh, Latin America, uh, and I now understand where the inspiration came from. Uh, mm -hmm. After running around this city this morning, mm -hmm. uh, getting lost in your park, which is quite easy to do, uh, <laughs> Uh, and that, that the traditions, the linkages, the heritage, and so forth uh, is very much shared, obviously, with your country, not just the language. Um, in the case of Cuba, um, my sense has always been that if you try something for maybe 40 or 50 years uh, and it really doesn't work, it's not all bad to try something else. Uh, and so I've generally been supportive of uh, the initiative, in some cases, we could have gotten a little bit better bargain, let's say, or something. Certainly, there are domestic political forces that will uh, push to re-examine that uh, policy decision, um, and we'll have to see how that plays out, frankly, whether those forces are sufficient. Uh, because, frankly, I think an awful lot of people on Capitol Hill in the U.S. Congress uh, generally view that you know, we weren't really getting anywhere with the previous policy. No. Uh, to, we were no, just isolating the country. Um, and the, the way to, to help Cuba transition over time uh, is clearly to expose them uh, to the benefits of being a more open, a more free, a more free market, uh, uh, a more welcoming to outside investment, a more attractive uh, destination. Uh, than it has been uh, under the Castro regime. Um, with respect to Venezuela, uh, an absolute tragedy, uh, a country that is among, I think, the top three in terms of crude oil reserves in the world. Uh, we still get quite a bit of their heavy crude, which we need for our refineries in the United States. <coughs> um, but to see all of that incredible bounty squandered uh, as they have, to see it mismanaged, uh, to see, again, stoking the forces of populism uh, with very socialist policies that ultimately uh, are the, the, the root of their own collapse. Uh, and to see this play out in slow motion as we have uh, is, is very, very sad. Uh, I, at the end of the day, there is no way that there is not a currency collapse uh, in Venezuela. Ar arguably, it's already taking place again in slow motion. Um, and at some point in time, uh, undoubtedly, some element is going to step in and say, okay, we have to come to grips with this. But when they do, it's going to be an extraordinarily painful experience for a country that, whose citizens have already uh, experienced a great deal of pain because of the terrible mismanagement uh, by Chavez first and then by his successor, Maduro. 
uh, plenty of questions about Qatar, Qatar and recent yeah. events, which is somehow related with, with what you ha have said about Cuba. No? Obama, Obama uh, had the dossier of, of <coughs> Iran for many, many decades. It wasn't working. He changed that also. But now apparently uh, Trump is so, so, uh, returning back no? uh, to, to, the, to the previous situation, uh, engaging with Saudi Arabia and not with Iran. How do you see the, this, this shift from Obama to, to Trump uh, and the situation now in, in, in the region? Well, look, first I mean, of all, let me just note is, that... Is Iran, can, can we deal with Iran or we should do that with Saudi Arabia? First of all, let, let's start it's always good to get the big ideas uh, and have an intellectual foundation. And let's start by recalling that there are really two Irans. Uh, there's the visible state and country, which, by the way, is very pro-American. Uh, I used to literally go to the, to the border between Iran and Iraq uh, because the Iranians, many of them, are going to the religious sites of Najaf and Karbala, the two holiest sites in Shia Islam, and then also Qadamiya and Samarra uh, further north. Um, and the old ladies would be coming through. They're all excited. This is, you know, it's termed accurately religious tourism. It is a wonderful uh, experience that they have. Many have looked forward all their life to the visit to, to Najaf, uh, if, if they've already been to, to Mecca. Uh, and they would come up to me and they would, you know, do this to my cheek. And my security guys almost cut off their arm one time. I mean, I think they were going to pull a pistol. I said, guys, it's okay. And they would say, we love America. We love you, General. It's okay. So there's that state that has an elected president who right now is the moderate of those, relatively speaking, still somewhat hardline in his rhetoric uh, at times, but was elected to uh, improve the economic uh, situation for the people of Iran. And he knows that, and he's tried to do it. It's why they had the Iran nuclear deal. Um, he's got an elected parliament. There are ministers. There's an army, navy, air force, marines. Looks like a normal state, except it's not, because there's the deep state. And the deep state is, of course, the leadership is the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, which has its own army, navy, air force, marines, and the Quds Force, uh, which is their overseas, uh, if you will, clandestine arm, covert action arm, uh, uh, and carries out various expeditions uh, in a variety of different countries, all of which are malign, which is why it has been labeled uh, designated a terrorist group. Uh, and then you have the besieged militia, which may number as many as a million now. And these are basically street thugs uh, who will be on those street swinging pipes if there is ever an attempt at something like the Green Revolution uh, that we saw some years ago on the streets of Tehran. So when you ask, you know, is Iran a friend or an enemy? Well, there's a part of it that really likes the West and America in particular. And, has, and we have a huge Iranian uh, diaspora in the United States that still can go back and forth. But then there's the deep state, which also, by the way, controls probably 40 percent of the Iranian economy now. Uh, and carries out a whole variety of illegal uh, activities. Um, I got a message from the commander of the Quds Force during the Battle of Basra in March and April of 2008. Uh, he was the supporter of the Shia militia, extremist militia, that Iraqi security forces were battling after the prime minister made quite an impulsive decision to order them in there, and we scrambled to support him, ultimately defeated, destroyed the militia there, destroyed them in Sadr City and Qadamiya and a variety of other places throughout southern Iraq. But he sent me a message during this time that said, General Petraeus, you should know that I, Qasem Soleimani, control the policy for Iran with respect to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, and Afghanistan. In other words, forget those diplomats. You deal with me. And obviously, I'd refused to do that. I told him to pound sand, and to use our term. Um, but that is very troubling. So how do you deal with a country that is almost bipolar, yeah. um, where the president really isn't completely the president? And of course, all of them report to the supreme leader. But this side is really trying to make sure that that regime stays in power above all, whereas some over here would be happy to see the regime uh, go away in a, 
again, a more open and so forth state. Ironically, there's, there really was a democratic election there. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe uh, that, that Saudi Arabia and, and the other Gulf Cooperation Council countries, and I would put Qatar in that, and, and we've got to work our way through this uh, current dispute uh, between the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Egyptians uh, with, with Qatar, clearly. Um, but again, you, they would be the first to say, okay, it's fair enough if you call us flawed friends. They are aware of some of the challenges of some activities that have taken place over the years. They are aware of the uh, nationality of many of the 9-11 bombers and so forth. Um, but they are making significant efforts uh, to change their countries, their economies, uh, their, their societies. I've sat with Mohammed bin Salman, the Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, on a number of occasions. I think I was the first American to whom he laid out his plan uh, probably over near two years, maybe longer ago, uh, in Riyadh. And it was breathtaking uh, what he wants to do. Uh, you know, he said, look, a woman can drive a camel in the, in the Koran. Why can't she drive a car today? Uh, why don't we have music? Um, what about films? Now, some of these are difficult. Yes, there are very conservative elements. Yes, there's the promotion uh, of Wahhabist uh, a form of Muslim, uh, of, of Islam in, in some Good. countries that has caused challenges. But at the end of the day, I do believe that they are flawed friends and that Iran uh, is an adversary, an adversary who is carrying out very malign activity uh, in Iraq, uh, in Syria, propping up a murderous butcher of a leader in Syria responsible for the death of some 500,000 of his own citizens. Lebanese Hezbollah, another designated mm -hmm. terrorist organization in, in southern Lebanon, uh, Hamas in Gaza, Houthis in Yemen, uh, and on and on. And that has to be countered. Doesn't mean, again, you couldn't have dialogue. It doesn't mean, again, there couldn't be areas of, uh, again, of mutual uh, uh, objection or, or objectives, but in many cases, uh, there are relatively few mutual interests and a lot of conflicting interests. And I think we just have to recognize that, um, while noting, again, that our friends uh, do uh, occasionally need a quiet word uh, behind the scenes, which mm -hmm. is far better than something done publicly. Last question, probably, according to the time, about uh, moving yes, it's back. it's almost to... time for a Spanish lunch, I guess. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're... <laughs> By the way, I do want to assure oh, you that no. I, I did not run before 9.30 this morning. I know that in anything before that time would be viewed as socially unacceptable. So <laughs> the, the day starts at that time. Yeah. 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock is all oh, right. Oh, 8 o'clock to run. Is, okay, and then in the right. office at 9.30. Next, next time you come, Tomorrow you can go. I'll be out there at the, 6. I think the, the El Retiro is open, is open by, by 8 o'clock. Okay. Uh, no, the question is about, the, obviously, the European Union as a military power, an independent military power. As you know, this project is re-emerging now, especially after yeah, Trump's uh, yep. visit to, to Brussels. Mm -hmm. So. How do you see this in relation to NATO, obviously? I mean, um, we, we... My concern with this, and I think there was something called the European Defense Initiative, in fact, the European yeah. European Defense Initiative, at various times when I was, um, you know, hustling bags for our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and so forth, and I worked for the Supreme Allied Commander uh, in another period. And my concern has always been that the res the objective is reasonable, um, that there be European capability. But unfortunately, what we get is actually no more infantry units or ships or planes or anything else. What we get is more headquarters. Um, and I mean, you all know the most emotional issue in NATO and I'm sure in the EU is flags to posts. Every country wants a headquarters. Everyone wants more general officer slots. In, in NATO, I used to think at times it was a jobs program for generals. That has been changed. <coughs> it's rationalized uh, very much. Uh, and a, a succession of, of great secretary generals and supreme Allied commanders and chairman of the military committee have seen to that with the country's support. But that, if you start with that as the big idea again, then tell me, is there going to be real capability? What is it that you're going to be able to do with an EU force mm -hmm. 
that you can't do with a NATO force. And now there are some cases in which you do that. And I see that in Bosnia, mm -hmm. by the way, where we need continued uh, effort. I'm quite concerned about the continued centrifugal forces in Bosnia. I was just there. I was in Montenegro, Bosnia, and Slovenia two weeks ago. We have a very large investment in the former Yugoslavia, 1.5 billion in telecommunications. This is not trivial. And, uh, and there, are, there are legitimate concerns. And that's an EU issue, really, first and foremost, I think. That is a place where the EU can, should, and does lead uh, with certainly uh, US involvement. Uh, but that's legitimate. But again, come back to does this, what does this provide that NATO cannot provide? Yeah. And when you work your way through that, then, you know, if, do we need an EU force as well as a NATO force, as well as a US force combating pirates off Somalia? Yeah, I take all of them as long as they all work together, but that just means there's more headquarters, uh, and I'd rather see those assets go into ships uh, or planes uh, or boots on the ground, as they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Since uh, this is the last question, or, do you have yeah, one more question? No, no I don't okay. have any more questions. Could I, no, I was just going to offer something to offer at the end. A final statement. Well, it's you very read kind. my mind. Yeah. Let me, let me raise our optimism. Let okay? me yes. convince, convince well, us look, that the U.S. I, is going well. There are huge opportunities mm -hmm. as well as huge challenges, and I believe in that. Um, in that course, I taught the North American decades mm -hmm. uh, the the opportunities for the United States and really the rest of the world. And we're now seeing European growth finally after the ECB said that he would do whatever it took and has done it. Just that alone has helped propel, uh, reignite growth uh, in Europe. Uh, hugely important at a time that China inevitably has to slow down some while still being the engine of a, you know, maybe a, as much as a third of the growth in the world. Um, so there's actually tremendous opportunities out there, I think. The improvements in the quality of life for the vast majority of, of those on Earth, the elevation of so many from poverty and so forth, uh, certainly in the midst of the challenges, the threats, uh, and the dangers that we've talked about here. But let me end, if I could, uh, yeah. by returning to where I started. Uh, and that is to say thank you, again, uh, to the Spanish people, to the Spanish government, mm -hmm. Uh, for the extraordinary partners uh, that they have been uh, in a variety of endeavors, uh, some in the military realm, some diplomatic, some uh, development assistance, uh, intelligence. Uh, this is a great partnership. Uh, Spain is a very substantial country. Uh, it's going to be more substantial as the UK leaves uh, the EU, in fact. Uh, and it has been a privilege to serve, to soldier with, uh, your men and women in uniform uh, over the years in a host of different assignments, all the way back to uh, Cold War Europe. Um, and it's a privilege to continue those relationships now. As I said, every Spanish citizen ought to be proud of those who have served in uniform, even if those Spanish citizens don't agree with the policies that they and we were executing uh, from time to time. And I've been heartened generally to hear that the approach has been that uh, which we've generally seen in the United States, uh, where Americans have broadly been supportive of their sons and daughters, their men and women uh, in uniform, even when they had questions about the policies that we are executing. I think that's the right approach. It's great to know that that, that has generally been uh, the case here. Uh, and let me just take the opportunity here to say thank you for that and thank you for the great partnership we've enjoyed over many, many decades. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Thank On you. behalf of, uh, of Elcano, this, this was your first trip to Madrid. It should, should not be the last one. It will not be. Thank you. Welcome. Thank always. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.